Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me again today on the podcast, on our video podcast. I have the uh, honor and the privilege today of having a new friend in the studio with us, uh, Mr. Bill Sayre. Bill, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah, so Bill and I met at one of my financial workshops in my financial firm. And, um, you know, usually I'm trying to attract these folks in to do business with me uh, from a financial planning point of view. But, Bill, you just intrigued me so much with your story and with what we're going to talk about today, which is a book that's coming out soon that's uh, co-written by yourself and Dr. Ford Brewer. That's correct, yes. Uh, who was previously at Johns Hopkins, I think, in, uh, in preventative medicine. That's correct, yes. Um, so we're he gonna, ran, the, ran the program. Ran the there. program there. Yeah. Um, and by the way, if you want to check out Dr. Brewer's YouTube, he's out there. You can just look up Dr. Ford Brewer, and uh, he's got about 75,000 subscribers there. So he's got a, a really nice YouTube channel going on preventative medicine, which is great which you're going to talk about today and some of the things that we can do to be uh, healthy, uh, reduce our risk of, of dying too soon from things that are absolutely preventable. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got a, a personal story behind that, which makes it real for you with your father and your mother, uh, who, by the way, your, your dad served our nation well, retired from the United States Navy. Um, and uh, at class of 1952 at the Naval Academy, you said? That's correct, yes. So one of the things we always like to do starting out our, our podcast is we like to pay tribute and salute those who are uh, putting it on the line every day uh, with our nation's military. So a little Johnny Walker here and salute to our nation's military, to your father, to your mother who served our nation well. Uh, cheers to them. And cheers cheers to you, and thank you for your service. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. Semper Fi. <laughs> cheers. cheers. If you want any more during the show, Bill, we'll get Noah to come over and pour us a little. It's a nice drop. Isn't that nice? nice? A, a very nice drop. Yeah. We, we were talking about some of our other favorite bourbons, whiskeys, and uh, scots. <laughs> uh, so my my favorite is... Johnny Walker Blue Label. It's uh, it's nice. um, That mixed barrel. And so one day, maybe Johnny Walker will uh, start sending us some (laughs) some spirits here to share with our guests. Maybe. So wouldn't we be so fortunate? So uh, on on your dad real quick, you were telling me before the show that – your your dad was a skipper on a destroyer. Do you do you remember the ships he was on? Uh, <clears throat> yes. So um, he commanded the USS Leary. Okay. Okay. Um, and he was also on the guided missile cruiser, uh, USS Boston. The Boston. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. As you, I remember when I was a child, we went to White Sands, New Mexico, where they have a missile testing base. Hmm. And so the Boston was one of the first with the um, with guided missiles on board. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was telling you my brother was on a guided missile destroyer um, when I was a young buck. Hmm. Uh, the the Lawrence, I think it's actually decommissioned now, but it was a D, DDG four guided missile destroyer. Yes. So. Yes. Pretty interesting, but you were telling me also that your dad, uh, as a I guess a secondary position as an officer, was also in the intel field. Yes, he uh, he served numerous times in the uh, in the Pentagon as a Soviet specialist. Wow! And then he was the um, the naval attaché in Pakistan. I graduated from high school in Pakistan. Did you really? Yes, and uh, at the time, the Russians were you know, looking at moving into Afghanistan uh, as a strategic move to get a port down near Karachi. And so that was, um, he helped establish uh, the island of uh, 
Diego Garcia as a major okay. uh, U.S. base. Right. That's yeah. uh, some intel and satellite communications kind of spawned out of that, that mm. region, right? Yeah. That's awesome. So that that brings me to a question on your, your background. You mm-hmm. know, when you and I met, you've you spent some time in uh, Australia. Yes. So would you really consider yourself an Aussie? <laughs> you spent most of your life there, right? Uh, yeah, 30 years. Yeah, there, so, there's half, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, look, I, I, I still go back and forth. Okay. I'll be going back to Sydney um, uh, mid, mid-November, I would say. So, um, look, Australia and the U.S. are our, our cousins. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and uh, and a matter of fact, Australia has served with the United States in more wars than any other ally. No kidding. That's correct. Yes. Okay, you're dropping some some knowledge on me. That I didn't know that. Yeah. So if I mean the UK has looked, it's probably the the largest ally, but but Australia has been the most loyal. Wow. So. Um, I like the idea of we're cousins too. So, the yeah. pastor at our church, uh, Clayton and Romy Ritter, a little shout out to them this morning. But Romy is uh, an Aussie. Mm. Um, her father uh, is actually well, she would be Irish Aussie. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, just a really interesting uh, family story there, and what's uh, gone on with them, and how her father migrated the family into Australia years ago, and. Most would say um, there's a wine out there, uh, 19 Crimes, I think it is. Have you heard it in the grocery store? It's the Australian uh, wine. Well, they're big on their wines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So bringing it back to uh, Australia was really a, a penal colony, right? It, it, it was established for all, where all the criminals were going to go from uh, That's That's from correct. England. That's that's correct. Yes, but that's not how you ended up in uh, in Australia, no, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I I was working in Europe and uh, met an Aussie, and um, this actually has an impact on the uh, on on the on the podcast today. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, he died from a massive heart attack oh at goodness. age fifty four. Wow! And so we had become engaged. And I'd wow. never been to Australia before, and she was the oldest sibling, and so she wanted to um, to go go back and and help her mom, mm. and so uh, off we went from um, from the Netherlands where I was working and she yeah. was working uh, to Sydney, and I decided I, I was in the banking industry. Decided that I really didn't want to be a banker, and and. And started um, some businesses. So I've been a business uh, establisher and founder, yeah. owner, operator. So your background is in consulting, business consulting. Pretty much, yes. And, you know, before the show started, you know, we're chatting about your father. And um, the big concern for our country back then was the Cold War and, and the Soviets you know, attacking us. Yes. And you, you drew this correlation to the biggest concern for our country today is, is not, you know, war, war's been around for 20 years, very, you know, a, a popular thing to talk about. I have a lot of folks in my client base that are warriors and SEALs and SWIC, Marines, Army Special Forces. But the number one killer in our country is not because of war. It's what we're going to talk about today, and that's our, our nation's health. And, and you're passionate about wanting to talk about that today. And you've you've kind of, seems like you've moved from the consulting world into, hey, let's have a conversation about how to deal with preventable disease that's killing millions across the world. Well, consulting is really about helping your client to solve a problem. Hmm. And I'm still doing that, just in a another genre, so to speak. Yeah. So in this genre now, uh, you've teamed up with Dr. Ford Brewer, 
uh, to work on this book. And it, it's, a, it's a rather long title, but it's a lot to get in. Um, and I don't know, maybe your literary agent or publisher will, will help you come up with a, a, a shorter title, but Seven Simple Tests That Could Save Your Life but your doctor's not telling you about it. That's correct, yes. So that's a mouthful, but it's a lot in that sentence, <laughs> uh, in that title. Um, share with me, if you will, the, the motivation behind uh, bringing this out, and I think it probably starts with your mom and dad, as you were telling me. Yes. Um, my, uh, my father had a heart attack, a stroke, and died of cancer. Hmm. My mother had diabetes and died of cancer. Wow. So I was a management consultant, um, overweight, out of shape. And um, I took a one-year sabbatical um, with one of my sons to travel around the U.S. We uh, were starting a small manufacturing business to yeah. uh, to develop and, and sell uh, a camping tool. We can, we can actually, that's a pretty cool tool. What little segue real quick, and we'll put it up on the site and share people about what your, your son's invented here. Um, tell us about that tool and then we'll come back to the real topic here. Well, it's um, similar quality to like a uh, Swiss army knife or a Leatherman, but it's the next size up. So it's five tools in one. There's a, there's a hatchet, a hammer, a, um, a saw, a shovel, and a hook. And basically, it's, it's five tools in one. It's uh, a little over a foot long, so you can, you know, put it under your seat in your Jeep or in your glove compartment. And um, it will basically perform just about every kind of camping um, uh, activity, yeah. you know, or, or need that you that you T- would have. Tell me the name of it again. It's called Adventure Mate. Adventure Mate. Yes. Playing off the Aussies there <laughs> a little bit, right? <laughs> that's that's Adventure correct. AdventureMate.com, yes. com, I believe it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ian, if you would uh, make sure while well, we're just chatting about that, if you want to put it up, and we'll we'll share the website for people to go take a look. It's still in the development phase or the. Well, we we did a kick a successful Kickstarter. Okay, and we're about another month off before we supply the 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 first um, adventure mates to our Kickstarter supporters, and nice. then after and then after that, it will be on sale to the general public. Very cool. Well, congrats to you and your son on that successful venture. Well. When we were traveling around, this is our second version, when we were traveling around the United States going to camping exhibitions, and I, I needed a sabbatical. Uh, I was in a very, very stressful job um, running a, uh, a management consulting practice. Um, we have you know, offices in, uh, in Tokyo and Seoul and Sydney and, and Auckland and, and, um, and Singapore. Hmm. So I took this one year off, and and I, you know, it's very very sad because my parents really they because of their health they they weren't able to travel to Australia anymore, and we would you know we'd always come over to the states usually once a year, but um, it'd been nice to have them come over, but they couldn't, and then they both passed. And I was looking at a cliff. And so I went on this journey to figure out how to bulletproof my own health. And as a result of that process, um, I believe I've been able to, as a result of, of numerous people much wiser than myself, uh, come up with a process that will do that. I've improved my health dramatically, and so I want to share that with as many people as possible. Yeah, it's awesome. You were telling me you were 
you were traveling, uh, I, I guess, like most business consultants, you were probably on the road a lot, eating bad food, not making the best choices uh, on the road when it comes to, to diet. And so you were overweight. Um, and when you saw what was happening with your parents, you were looking down the barrel. And I th- you used the, uh, the term earlier that, the, help me with this, the handgun is the disease? Well, or- no, the, a lot of people think that, that stress and genetics is going to determine their, their health fate. Okay. It's neither one of those. Hmm. And genetics is like the gun. And your lifestyle is what pulls the trigger. I like that. Genetics is the gun. Your lifestyle is the trigger. Yeah. And by the way, when I talk about stress, and yes, stress is important. and We all want to get our stress down. But during World War II, when there was rationing and the, let's say, Holland, Denmark, the U.K., they... they Pretty much be, because most of the, the meat and dairy was eliminated from their diets from the general populace because it was either saved for the, you know, for the army or the Germans had, had occupied it, yeah. and confiscated it. Um, heart disease and stroke went down dramatically during those war years. And then once the war was over and... and, and they were able to then um, go back to their old ways of eating. Then, you know, heart attack and stroke uh, went up to pre-war levels. Wow. So the point is that when you're being shot at and occupied, your stress levels are through the roof. Okay. But actually heart disease and stroke, heart attack and stroke went down. Went down. So it wasn't attributed to stress it was attributed to diet Mm. Mm. so at your heaviest how how heavy were you well i was another 20 pounds heavier than i am now wow and i'm a reasonably small frame person and so you could really tell yeah yeah so you you're facing this um, head-on with your parents, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. I mean, the big three. Mm-hmm. Uh, you talk about in... in and the, Alzheimer's, by the way. In, oh, yeah. In the U.K., Alzheimer's is the number one killer now. Wow. The number one killer. The number one killer. Jeez. So you, you said to me earlier, Kenny, five diseases in our country and mm-hmm. maybe the world. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you said that there are five diseases that account for 86% of health costs. Is that in the U.S. or is that worldwide? No, no, in the U.S. In the U.S. Yes. Let's talk about those. Okay. Well, there's heart disease, which accounts for heart attack and stroke. Um, then the three main cancers other than than um, lung cancer, which that's attributed, 90% of lung cancer is attributed to smoking. So let's just park that to the side, okay? Let's assume that you're not a smoker. Okay. Cigars counting that? Um, I don't know. Let's hope not. <laughs> I do like a cigar every now and again, <laughs> along with my Johnny. In moderation. Well, my understanding is you don't really inhale cigars. Yeah. So then you're probably all right. How about the guys like Joe Rogan out there that are smoking weed and inhaling it? Is that, uh, it's got a, I guess it does, doesn't, the excuse is it doesn't have the tars and the additives and chemicals that are American tobacco. Well, for instance, in California, the f- seven major tobacco companies were all required by court order, to run an ad on TV saying that they were responsible for making their tobacco more addictive. 
Mm. Right. I remember that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, but I don't want to get off, mm -hmm. you know, Beating topic here. Since, right. So with, um, so getting back to those, those five major killers, first one is heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. The second one are the three main cancers of them, and then um, lung cancer, and that's bowel, which is the number two killer, mm. uh, breast and, and uh, prostate cancer. Then there's diabetes, and, and pre-diabetes, by the way. And then hypertension or high blood pressure, and then dementia come Alzheimer's. Mm. You know, bringing it back to this environment that we're in now, Bill, um, you know, COVID is still uh, a big killer in the U.S. Mm -hmm. this year. 200,000-plus yes. folks have passed from COVID. But most of those deaths, according to, I think, Johns Hopkins. Yes. Has to do with comorbid factors. And those comorbid factors are those that you've just mentioned the diabetes, the, uh, the heart disease, hypertension being the, I think the big three yes. are the comorbid factors. Um, so it's interesting that if those weren't there, uh, the likelihood, and also if age and weight plays into those comorbid factors. So all the things you're talking about in, in your book, but you say there's some ways to actually prevent or maybe even reverse. And I, I have to, I probably should have did this at the beginning of the show. You're not a physician. No. Uh, so you're not giving medical advice today. I'm not giving I'm medical not giving advice. medical advice. No. Uh, Dr. Ford Brewer, on the other hand, is a physician and does want to promote better health yes. in our country and better yes. Testing. And he, he promotes on his um, YouTube channel these, um, these tests that we'll be discussing today. Okay. So those simple tests, um, we won't go through all of them today, but in your book, one of the big ones, uh, as we were talking about heart disease, is um, some of the motive and personal motive that you had for getting involved and in reaching out to medical experts saying, hey, let's get this information in the people's hands so that they can have information. Information's power. Once you have the information, then you have the capability of the personal information. And I think that was the key factor in our, our pre-production interview here was having the information that you can actually do something with it personally versus I think the term you'd used was the bell curve of just being a statistic you're saying these tests can actually help you as an individual change the trajectory of your your health. Absolutely. Um, in my personal life, um, in the professional life, I believe that ultimately we're all responsible for the decisions that we make. Mm. Now... You're in the business of helping people with their financial assets. Right. And I believe that health is our number one asset. I concur. Because if we don't have that, yeah. we're not going to have anything else. You look at all the, the successful people on this planet, um, and one that comes to mind specifically for me had pancreatic cancer. Uh, He's left us, left mm -hmm. this world way too early, uh, and that was the Apple founder. Um, and, you know, he actually talked about that in his uh, biography. I, f I forget who helped write that. Was it Isaac Jacobson? I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. You have to look it up for me, if you would. Um, but he talked about, look, I've got all the money in the world. Yes. And I it's the most valuable company in the world today to, and couldn't do anything to reverse the effects of pancreatic cancer. Um, but some of the things that you talk about is early prevention, early knowledge. Um, so, you, you know, if Steve Jobs would have had early and he was fairly early in finding out about pancreatic cancer, but things like heart disease that if, if you find out 
early, that is a major step towards reversing the effects of heart disease you were sh- sharing with me. A lot of people may not be aware, but you can cure yourself of heart disease through lifestyle, mm. without a doubt. Mm. There's huge amounts of, of evidence, and everything that I've talked that I talk about is is based on on evidence on medical evidence not on you know uh, wishful thinking or hearsay or whatever and um, yeah absolutely but the but the key is to um, realistically find out what level of disease you have and if or if you have disease and then um, because, for instance, what people consider um, cures for heart disease, and basically what's in a, a physician's kit bag is is pharmaceuticals or you know like a, a statin yeah. at early stages, or let's say a stint, or possibly bypass surgery. But none of those actually cure you of the disease. They just um, stave off the, the, the symptoms. The inevitable, yeah. Exactly. The symptoms are still there, and uh, we were talking about this earlier, that Western medicine typically treats uh, the, the cause. So if you've got heart disease, they go, okay, and you're at this point of de- death. Okay, well, let's, do, let's crack your chest and do bypass surgery. Let's put a stent in if you're that fortunate to not have surgery, but we'll stick it in your groin and shove it up in your heart where the problem's at. Um, Or maybe you're early enough that we give you a pharmaceutical and give you a statin to um, lower the risk. But you're you're bringing it back that if you do some of these early tests, I think you talked about a CAC test, C-A-C. Yes, it's it's um, otherwise called a calcium score. Okay. You, you've heard of hardening of the arteries? Yes. Because this has nothing to do with uh, with calcium in your bones. Okay. It's what happens is that plaques, over time, plaques in your arteries and in your heart, they, they calcify. And so the calcium score is going and getting a CAT scan, which very accurately measures the level of calcification in your arteries or heart. Mm-hmm. Um, which tells you a very accurate risk level, um, whether you're at low, medium, or high risk of, of having a heart attack or a stroke. Okay. So <clears throat> are you saying every person should go out today and get it? Okay. And, and again, you're not giving medical advice, but it, from a person who's been around physicians and experts, cardiologists, why aren't our doctors saying, hey, let's run a, a, a CAC on you. Let's do this imagery and mm-hmm. see how your arteries look. Why aren't they doing that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the reason they're not is that they're trained to, to work on, on symptoms. Okay. Okay. They're not trained in preventive medicine. Two percent of the dollars spent in our health care system today is on preventive medicine. Two percent. Two percent. Yes. On preventative medicine. On preventative medicine, yes. So is that insinuating that 98 percent? Is basically treating symptoms. Wow. And often, and with those five major conditions, um, the way they're treated do not actually cure them. They just, um, let's say, work on the symptom. For instance, like if you get bypass surgery, maybe another five, or if you don't change your lifestyle, it could be five, seven years, and, and you're going to need another bypass surgery. Mm-hmm. So an example of this in the world that I can understand, like with my car, Every five to 10,000 miles, change your oil. Mm-hmm. 
um, rotate your tires, take your car in for a preventative maintenance inspection. And every time I, I've got a, a really nice BMW X7, give a shout out to BMW there. But they pride themselves on these cars lasting for years and years and years without um, big maintenance issues. Um, but they require a preventative maintenance routine. Come in, let's check to make sure that everything's right. And the little things that they can fix or that need a little repair or a, a preventative fix, mm -hmm. um, you, you do those every, every so often. So you, th this exam is not a costly exam, I guess, for, for the industry or for health insurers? Well, health insurers don't pay for it. Okay. Okay. At least the majority of them don't. Um, you will have to pay out of pocket, and, and we could, that's a whole other topic. Okay. Um, but generally, it's, it's around $100 to have a, um, a calcium score done. It's, it's kind of like a mammogram of the heart. Okay. And since I'm on mammograms, what's interesting for the ladies in your audience is that for every one woman who gets breast cancer, five have a heart attack. Hmm. And most women over the age of they may be 45 have mammograms. But very, very few women have ever had a calcium score done. Wow. And heart disease, is that number two with women behind cancer in our country? Um, in terms of death? I don't know. I, 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 I don't. I, I'm, I'm not not sure. I, I still think that heart, because like I said, you know. It goes undiagnosed. Fi well, five women have heart attacks, you know, to every one who has breast cancer. So I, I, I don't know the actual stats on that, but I, I would presume that more women die of, of, of heart attack. Hmm. I do know that less women have heart attacks than men. Generally, when they do have them, they tend to be more fatal. Yeah. Wow. So you, you, there's a video out there. We'll actually put it up on our um, – that you'd shared with me. We'll put it up on our podcast uh, talking about the Widowmaker. Yes. Um, and it, it's a piece that kind of goes along with uh, your, your book and what you and Dr. Brewer are writing about that – Healthcare costs in our country is obviously out of control. But if we were doing preventative maintenance, so to speak, if we were looking at these uh, high-risk medical issues face on and knowing early with early detection, um, we should be able to drive this healthcare costs down by, number one, you, you said this to me earlier, um, before we went live, um, and I'm going to paraphrase, but, you know, Kenny, if you're on a bell curve, you're a statistic, right? But if a physician comes to you and says, hey, here's your test, here's your specific numbers, like with the CAC, and from using the, the, the calcium score from 0 to 100, if you're in that category, you're low risk. And I think you'd shared with me that uh, when you got yours done, uh, after losing some weight and after um, doing some alternative diet um, changes in your life, you had a score of like 32, which is exemplary of there. there's a little bit of calcium there in your body. But for, for many folks that fall in that 100 to 400, that's medium, uh, medium associated risk. with medium risk, we'll call yes. it. Yes. And then if a person has a score over 400, they're at high risk, for heart attack, stroke, or uh, so, or may, maybe even onset of dementia and Alzheimer's in the future, because that's just the plaque yes. or calcium in the in the brain. Yeah. So take me back to this calcium thought process. The plaque is is the problem, but the calcium is there to try to help and cover that up. But what happens, I guess, is that over time, um, that calcium coming in trying to rescue and fix the plaque issue 
explain a little more. I'm, I am stumbling through that, trying to define what's happening in our body. Well, see, generally speaking, for your audience that is, let's say, um, 45, 50, okay. uh, 55 on up, then the calcium score, which is um, – your your arteries get calcium get get plaque in them, okay, and that plaque lodges in your um, intima layer of your artery, and it becomes inflamed. And when it ge- becomes inflamed, it can rupture, and if it goes to the heart, it's a heart attack. If it goes to the brain, it's a stroke. The Your body, as a natural defense, lays down calcium over that diseased artery, Mm. okay, on the interior of that that artery. Okay. Now, calcium is very, very easy to detect using a CAT scan. Now, if you're, let's say, under the age of 50, you may have plaque, which can be very dangerous, and life threatening, but a calcium score may not, you know, because it hasn't cal- the plaque hasn't calcified yet, may not be picked up. Okay. So there's another another test called a CIMT test, which effectively is getting a ultrasound of your carotid artery and other arteries in your body. They give. Um, will indicate how much plaque you have, um, which indicates how much disease you have. Hmm. Okay? So depending on what age you're at, uh, I recommend um, anyone, you know, over 50 should get both because you may not have calcified plaque, but you, you know, you may have dangerous plaque in in your arteries. An insurer is not going to cover this, you were saying. So what what kind of costs is a person going to incur in getting the— Around $100. So can they call their primary care physician and say, "Hey, I want I, a calcium I, score." I would like to get this calcium score test. Yes, write write me a prescription. Yeah, and you take it to wherever you know you get X rays or CAT scans, and they'll do that. Um, a cardiologist will examine that that um, that um, you know, let's say X ray of the yeah. heart, okay, and and give you a score. So when they get this score, what do they do with it? They take it back to the primary care physician? Do they take it to the cardiologist? Who? They they, well, first of all, it's self-explanatory. So if if you're under a hundred, then you're, then you're at low risk of heart attack. If but that doesn't mean go eat a gallon of ice cream or. No, it it means that you've you've <laughs> been doing, that you're on the right track, but. As you get older, your risk increases. Mm. So if you're at, let's say, your calcium score is an 80, then you might want to improve your diet even more. Okay. Okay? Um, But if you're over 100, and especially over 400, then you need to consult your, your physician immediately. And... They may recommend a, um, you know, a statin or a stint. Yeah. But but you can, um, you can cure yourself of that disease of, of you rid yourself of of plaque. Yeah. Uh, through diet and lifestyle. So you were sharing with me that you were for, for your frame for your size you were um, you were overweight according to the. The scale, the BMI, I guess, or the body mass index scale. Um, did you have a, a CAC score? Did you have a test done before you went on this journey to improving your health? Or did you do it after the fact? So do you have a baseline to be able to compare scores over time? Um, no, I don't. I've, I've, I've had the one score. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and because it was under a hundred and 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 under fifty, it was it was pretty good. Okay, you know, 
on the other hand, though, um, the CMIT score, which measures your soft plaques, uh, had that done, and that wasn't that was medium risk. So even though some of my calcium, some of my plaque hadn't calcified yet, I still had. Um, I wasn't happy with that score. Hmm. So I did improve my diet further and my lifestyle. And, um, and I recently had one, uh, I th- it was in May, and um, I'm all clear. So I wow. obviously... Good for you. I've, I've cleared out those, those plaques. Yeah. So uh, the, and the reason I ask that is to give folks hope who may go out after listening to this podcast and go get that score, and their scores could be pretty scary or could be on the verge of being high, but there's, there's a way to reverse it. There's one of the doctors that, that, that I follow. Um, his name's Dr. Michael Greger, and he, he recently wrote a book called How Not to Die. Okay. And in that book, he attributes him going into, into medicine— um, to his grandmother. And his grandmother had had two bypass surgeries and was basically sent home to die because they couldn't give her another one. And she attended the Pritikin, client, uh, Pritikin Clinic, changed her lifestyle, cured her heart disease, because she was at age 65, okay, and went on to live for another 30 years Wow! when her, when her doctors had basically given her a death sentence because mm. they couldn't give her another bypass surgery. You said that, that was Dr. McGregor. Michael Gregor, yes. Gregor, uh, How Not to Die. How Not to Die, yes. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Now, that book is primarily based on diet and lifestyle. The reason that I've written about these tests that people are mostly unaware of and their doctors don't tell them about it is that, to me, motivation to change my diet and lifestyle was based on knowing what risk level I was at. Mm. So I, I knew my, my genetic profile. But when I took the um, CMIT score and saw that I was at mid-level risk because of calcium buildup, that gave me the motivation to, to change my diet and lifestyle and to cure my disease. Wow. So let, let's um, talk about that motivation so when when you decided to write this book and you decided to reach out and you and Dr. Brewer come together on this this book uh number one motive for writing the book then would be well the number one motive was that I was I was fortunate enough to have the information and knowledge to change my lifestyle and, and, and diet and, and to cure myself of disease. Mm. But I, I wouldn't have done that unless, you know, I was able to, to see what my risks were. Yeah. And so now I would just like to share with other people so they don't have to go through the experience of losing their parents like I did or possibly lo- losing their own life or you being know, disabled. We do the same thing in the financial business. We, we assess folks with a risk score mm. and it allows them to see their willingness to take risk. And then it also takes that opportunity of saying, okay, well, I'm, yeah, I'm willing to take some risk and scoring that from zero to 99, zero being, uh, a person who lives under a rock financially, 99, those who would financially jump off a roof without a parachute. Mm. Um, but then it aligns that risk with how they're actually invested. 
Yes. So it sounds like you're doing the same thing here. You're going, hey, this this just gives you a personal assessment that's not just based solely on statistics, but based on how you're actually living and what's going on inside your body. And so the motive to get these tests into the hands of consumers to say, hey, this is a personal investment in you to look at your own scores to figure out whether or not um, you've got some things you need to change in your life. Is that, is that accurate? Absolutely. And unfortunately, um, you talked about assessing. Unfortunately, um, your primary care doctor today using your cholesterol um, you know, level, yeah. your blood pressure, and, and possibly a stress test is guessing. Hmm. Where if you do these tests, you're actually assessing your true risk level rather than uh, guessing against a, a bell curve that, um, that doesn't actually measure what disease you have in your body. Interesting. So the, the, being able to get that knowledge out there, number one, is, is a big push for your personal motivation in doing that. And you unfortunately had to go through personal trauma, personal experience with family members loved ones, and that kind of giving you the wake-up call. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that fair? That's absolutely, because I'm, I'm, I'm confident that if I hadn't changed, I would have ended up just like my parents. Wow, wow. Um, so number two, you had shared with me that motivation is giving the power to the individual patient, the consumer of health care, mm-hmm. um, a, a better tool for communication with their doctor. Yes. So coming up with a better treatment plan based on assessment versus uh, uh, s- statistics. Just like your clients, ultimately, you can give them the best advice in the world, but they need to take responsibility for their own financial well-being. Yeah. Well, your doctor can tell you you need to change your your diet and your lifestyle. But ultimately, it's up to you. You had a quote earlier. You, uh, I think it was off camera. You said measure to manage. That's that's correct. As as a management consultant, we would assess a situation with a client. We would measure where they were at to figure out um, how we, you know, if they needed fixing and and how we were going to fix whatever the problem was. And unless you are measuring something, it's very, very difficult to manage it. Hmm. But once you do, once you know where you're at, then you know where you need to go. And then it's basically figuring out how you're going to get there and, and doing what you need to do to end up where you want to be. Yeah. So like with yourself, when you did this calcium score, uh, the very first one kind of gave you a baseline. Yeah. And then as you've progressed over time and doing other imagery exams, and uh, I, I don't want to give away everything in the book, but as you go through um, the different types of tests that can be uh, part of your own personal assessment to build baselines to measure performance, both good and bad, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, you had, in, in that conversation, you had talked about folks in other parts of the world uh, that you had referred to as blue zones. Yes. Uh, h- help us understand these, these blue zones and what, what your findings and what findings of medical professionals who had done some research in other parts of the world. Well, the National Geographic condition, um, they commissioned a study to go to different parts of the world and to research uh, centenarians, you know, people who made gen- it to 100. Made it to 100 or over. Yeah. And there were certain areas of the world that, that um, statistically had a very high level of these centenarians. Hmm. And they called them these blue zones. And, and generally, those particular areas 
did not have or had a very, very low level of these five major conditions that are the big killers in, in our healthcare system today. Mm. Wow. So, and, and, um, so anyway, it's, <laughs> it's basically looking at who does a good job at staying healthy. And, and, and by the way, it's not only just living to 100 or older. It's that these people um, lived well. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the, I think it's about 80% of the average American, their last 10 years of life, certainly was the case with my parents, they did not have a good lifestyle. Yeah, the they quality suffered. goes the way quality down. The quality goes way down, way down, and they suffered. Yeah. Yeah, there was a TED Talk. I think you and I probably saw the same one that um, I am blanking on the physician right now. If I can remember, we'll put it up on the podcast. But talking about uh, this physician had said the last seven years of life is where health care costs increases by about 70%. Yes. In the last seven years. And that most of a person's wealth that they've accumulated is spent on those last seven years of health care costs, yeah. which is unfortunate. And so if we can if we can spend a little money, even if we got to spend money out of pocket, I think is what you're, you're saying to the public here is take personal responsibility for your own health. Don't wait for the insurance company to pay for these exams. Go get these exams yourself, even if you got to pay out of pocket. And start spending the money more on health care, but on personal care of your diet, your food choices. Am I getting that right? Absolutely. And, and, a, and a, like we said before, a calcium score is about $100. A CMIT score or this, this um, ultrasound of your arteries is about $125. That's going to be the cheapest insurance you ever paid for. Yeah. Um, we'll, it, we'll go politics for a minute. So... Obviously, there's a, a massive amount of debate, and we're coming up in an election year on health care and how to pay for it and what, what should be paid for. Uh, I- any ideas on how to make health care accessible to the poorest of the poor in our country? I guess Medicaid would be in some ways uh, the answer to that right now. Um, but Medicaid's not going to go pay for these tests. Let, let me say this. I've lived in the Netherlands, and I've lived in Australia. Now, both of those countries have universal health care, okay. as does Germany and France and the U.K. and the Scandinavian countries, et cetera. Sure. But what I will say is, because, you know, a health care debate, is another another topic all together. Sure, we, we don't we don't have time, but we got about ten minutes left on our podcast today. Okay. So. <laughs> what I will say though, all the developed countries have similar diets to the United States. Ours, unfortunately, is the worst. Okay, we have the largest uh, percentage of obese obesity in this country, um, but. All of these countries are headed for a health care cliff. Hmm. So it doesn't matter whether it's private insurance or, or whether, you know, the, the government pays for medical costs. Social or private, right? Okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. We, the, the number of people that will be sick and need help, like I said, in the U.K., Alzheimer's is the number one killer. Now, that's wow. hugely expensive. There are 800,000 strokes in our country today. Now, not everyone is, is completely disabled from a stroke, but a lot of them are. Yeah. So regardless, and this is all on the increase, and um, we simply cannot keep increasing the spend expenditure on health care regardless. Right. And, but what's even more important um, is just... Our, our health is at such risk. So this brings me back, uh, Bill, to kind of that number three motive for you, that you're a businessman, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And may, maybe some would accuse you 
of, oh, Bill, you're, you're, you're writing a book to be an opportunist. I, mm-hmm. I don't personally believe that. Um, I've had a chance to get to know you a little bit and know, know your heart and passion behind this. But uh, you and I as business people, and that's who I try to interview in, in my, my podcast, uh, there, there is some motive there to get into the minds of these physicians to say, ch- change the way you practice and the health insurance industry will, will follow. And you, you had this idea and thought that maybe we change uh, health insurance premiums in our country if we can start testing and proving that you as a consumer have taken personal responsibility um, and therefore by showing these tests and these exams and your improvement and your personal responsibility of your diet to your exercise, now the health care costs can be reduced. You want to share a little bit about that and the, the idea behind maybe motive number three? With Well, well <laughs> technology today is enabling all of us, whether it's uh, sleep apps, you know, and measuring sleep apnea. and My snoring. You know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, to blood pressure and all kinds of things. So, you know, there's uh, lots of technology out there to help us. But our primary health care physicians do not have the time to coach us through the process of lifestyle change. And so at some point, I'm going, rather than consulting the business, I'll be, you know, establishing a, a coaching process to help people improve their lifestyle uh, and diet so that um, they, they can improve their tests and they won't suffer from these diseases. Wow. So um, just like if you're a non-smoker, Or if you're a, um, you know, you're a a safe driver, you get reductions in your insurance costs. Sure. Well, with these tests, we'll be able to prove whether you're healthy or not and whether you're at low risk or not, which will ultimately translate into lower insurance costs. Hmm. So, um, look, there's... I think there's a huge opportunity in many areas of of a paradigm shift in the way we approach medicine today. Yeah. I've seen that already uh, in my industry and in the, the life insurance side, that um, the big data drives the insurance premium, j- drives the approval even, um, that in many cases – Clients under 65, older than 18, we're able to do exams that measure the data to be able to tell them their mortality factor, which obviously sets the pricing for life insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, Doing that same thing on the health insurance side, that's that's innovation. Mm. Uh, Being able to take this data to drive down health care costs. and that's where you could get into groups and sampling um, that if we know if we've got in this group, 80% of this group out of the 10 insureds, 80% of them have stellar health. You can, you can mix in some of the unhealthy and because that's risk. Knowing what risk you take on is what insurers really w- want to know is, well, what's our claim expectation? The claims we're going to have to pay, um, and in today it's it's kind of the industry's blindfolded in many ways, and that's where, in some ways, I'm going to get too much into the politics with five minutes left on our podcast. But when you're blindfolded and you're being told, "Hey, here's the people you're going to have to insure," um, and you don't know their behavior, you don't know how they eat, how they exercise, uh, their their genetics. Which plays, we were talking about that, plays a big part in this process. But for a person like yourself, you were sharing with me, um, you read a book, Younger Next Year, by uh, uh, Crawley and then uh, Hen- Henry Lodge, I think it was. That's correct, yes. Um, that kind of helped motivate you with your personal habits 
and you were sharing with me you do like a 10 mile bike ride is that all right um so share with me kind of some of the things you've done since you've taken these exams and these tests what did you do personally to change your lifestyle well before covid i was going to the gym five days a week nice you know and 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 doing resistance training and 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 aerobic uh doing sauna and a number of other things okay um but now you know just the minimum someone should be doing the absolute minimum is walking 1 hour a day mm. getting the steps in getting the steps in and if you yeah. walk 1 hour a day um that will take you a long long way to helping your health. That said, though, the number one predictor of health and the biggest impact on your health is your diet. Hmm. And so <laughs> Crowley's a bit of a funny character, but he, he just says, stop eating crap. Right. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah, no crap. Yeah. yeah. So whether, whether you're, you know, a... Uh, a paleo person or a keto person or a vegan whole food plant-based person, what you really want to do is increase the amount of vegetables, whole foods in your diet. Try to eat as few processed foods as possible and do some exercise. But don't guess, assess, get these tests and understand what your real health risk is. Yeah. In the grocery store, it reminds me, I can't remember who to give credit to, but the the author or the speaker said, stay on the outside aisles of the grocery store <laughs> yes. and you'll be okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the fresh vegetables, the, 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 the cold refrigerated stuff, uh, and maybe even some of the frozen stuff, but the frozen stuff gets leached and the, the nutrients get taken out. Well... You know, kind of back to COVID, one of the, one of the other big determinants of, of people getting sick is, is their immune system. Yeah. And if you have a bad diet, your immunity will be compromised. Mm. And if you have an excellent diet, your immunity will be much, much greater and your risk much lower. Wow. So, Bill, exercise, eating right, assessing S early. Sleeping, too. And so, sleeping. The, so, the holy trinity, I think you'd call it, right? Yes, yes. You said diet, exercise, sleep. And, and, and all of us can do better on all three of those. Wow. Um, so when do you think the book will be, be out? Uh, we're looking at um, June next year. Okay. So, man, we got a really early glimpse into uh, seven simple tests that could save your life, but your doctor's not telling you about it. That's correct. So when the book releases, can we get you back? Can we do another hour with you? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Um, hey, thanks so much for your time today. Our time's up, but uh, June next year, we're going to have you back, and we'll do a, um, a book release uh, interview with you. Uh, Wealth and Knowledge, Bill Sarris, thanks for being with me today. I really appreciate it, man. It's great meeting you, and thanks for uh, coming and joining us today. Likewise. Thank you, KP. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. You too.